Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified Podcast Flash Webinar. We're joined by someone who has extensive experience in the sales sales management and sales operations field. Um, first sales or well, sales operations exposure came in around 2005, but first sales operations dedicated role in around 2000. And 15. So we, we have a lot of experience in the room today. Um, Ian, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't actually mention you, your current role. So Ian's currently Director of Revenue Operations at Teradata. Um, Teradata have big customers and not that many salespeople. So we're going to be diving into this kind of long enterprise sales cycle in this interview. Um, I'm super excited to understand your role, your entry into sales operations as well. So. We'll kick off with the first question about how you actually managed to transition into sales operations from the, the sales management role if you were doing. Yeah, so it started back in uh, 98 when I joined a company called National Instruments in the graduate training in, program. In 98? 98, yeah. New engineer, graduated mm -hmm. with a degree from Surrey mm -hmm. and thinking, I need to find a company that can give me some good skills, will get me up and running. A year or two later, I'm going to head off and find a new company to work for using those skills as my yeah. first proper job. Well, I stayed there 18 years. Um, <laughs> and along the way, that's when I'd, I suddenly realized from entering National Instruments as a graduate engineer, thinking really I wanted to be an engineer, to very quickly realizing that I enjoyed spending time with complex problems and speaking to customers mm. um, rather than sitting in, sitting in a back office working on design projects or coding or similar. So I very quickly moved into a sales role there, um, working with automotive, aerospace customers around the UK. And I'd, I transitioned into a sales management role in 2005, taking ownership of a sales team in the southeast of the UK and Ireland. And I think I had Scotland at the very start as well, um, working with sales engineers, so all very technical people with very technical customers. And in 2005, no one really had sales operations as a function. We mainly had um, customer operations, so very good customer services and operational functions around BRP and making manufacturing work, making finance work, delivering things. We had a relatively comprehensive but basic CRM from Oracle at the time, I think it was. And so sales managers were expected to not just coach and manage their teams and work with the customers. They're expected to do a lot of the functions you'd expect with sales operations today. So I was spending my time not just coaching my team and actually building the team. I was responsible for defining coverage, looking at performance management and actually ranking rating, doing forecasting, which uh, was something I, I really got into. I really enjoyed. I discovered that my engineering training, the use of data, I could do some quite cool things and get a relatively good level of accuracy compared to our old ways of doing things. Um, and then also building out enablement and building training programs and building the whole kind of structure for the, the sales organization. So we had a team of sales managers. I think there were two of us to start with, each with a, a set of salespeople. And I did more and more of the sales operation side of things. And over time, I found that being an important part of my, my sales management job. Um, so I ended up um, being part of the, the advisory board for our global team on which CRM should we choose, how do we evolve it. I got heavily involved into training and sales conferences. And then I had the opportunity to shift countries and run a sales team in France, um, which was fantastic fun, but really important to my development as well. Because working with a team in another country doing the same job, you can suddenly see the differences between styles between different countries, differences in sales process. We were saying the same things, the same kind of customers, but actually the approaches, the process, the styles, and what you need to do to work with the sales teams to make them effective was completely different. Um, and then I evolved into a, a leadership role looking after the aerospace business across all of EMEA. And that meant I, I suddenly was exposed to Swedish customers and salespeople, um, people in Germany, Spain, Italy, and understanding quite a complex business. This was um, you know, a, a major sector for National Instruments. Um, and so I was a matrix lead worked with a lot of different salespeople and coaching some of the newer ones on approaches, account planning, and similar. And so all of that led up to a great opportunity where I was headhunted internally to take ownership of a sales transformation program and effectively start a new function, which was called sales effectiveness. So at that point, we'd, at National Instruments, we'd realized that there was a need for a more formal set of sales 
operations expertise. And we had a global operations leader who'd been pulling together some of this capability by herself. Which year was this? Well? This was 2014. Um, and I've been working with her on sales conferences, um, applying different content, applying opportunity reviews or account planning and similar. And so I interviewed and was asked to take on this new role where I had a, a series of stakeholders across the world um, who were sales directors. And my mission was to roll out a single sales process wow. and a single CRM to a thousand plus sellers, multiple managers, marketing, all the other functions together. And it was a, a huge program for us. So I was the voice of sales. We had business analysts. We had IT implementation of Salesforce. We were starting to make the shift to better sales analytics. So for two years almost, I was in the, the center of this crazy transformation. We called it STEP, the sales transformation to enable performance. Um, you need a good logo and a brand when you're doing big transformation. Um, and that was the moment where I got to expose to proper sales process design done professionally, changing the minds of leadership, changing the approaches, moving people to being more data driven. And for, for two years, I was in my element. And I realized actually I enjoy being a sales manager but this is 10 times more fun, 10 times more fulfilling. And it's more the kind of thing I want to be doing. I want to work with analytics. I want to work with smart people. Um, and that was the moment where I realized I've been with the company 18 years. It's time to try something new. So I, taking that background, I headed off, um, moved to London, joined a small startup that was focused on analytics that needed a sales leader and an operations leader. And I slowly built out sales process, sales teams, and effectively started the, the fundamentals of building a, a, a sales operation structure from scratch. We got acquired and continued that within the, the acquired company to the point where I got exposed both to this big world um, with national instruments and now I seem to small scale. And then at the end of last year, um, I had the opportunity to, to speak with Teradata and I saw a company that was just in the midst of this giant transformation again. And Teradata, we're a... Uh, Two and a half billion um, dollar organization. We work with the huge customers, people like Volvo, PayPal, Air France, um, and we're really at the heart of their, their analytics and business intelligence and driving answers out of all this comprehensive data they have. And so I had a chance to, to take on effectively the EMEA challenge. And EMEA is a huge um, organization that um, really needs some very dedicated sales and revenue operation support. So here we are. Yeah, here we are. Uh, <laughs> What a journey. Um, just so we have some reference for your current position now, so how many salespeople is your operations team supporting? So we've got about um, 100 account executives across the year, but because we work with large complex customers, though we have account executives, most of our accounts in our enterprise space actually have a team of three or four different stakeholders mm -hmm. who work for that account. So you have the account executive, you generally have a, a pre-sales or a solutions consultant. You have a business consultant. And for most of our larger accounts, there's also an engagement manager for our services team. Mm -hmm. So it's not one salesperson working purely by themselves in the account with a number of people who come in and help occasionally. Actually, it's a dedicated triad or quad of people who are focused on that account or maybe two accounts total. And they're driving customer success. They're driving expansion. Mm -hmm. And they're driving you know, complex deals um, over a long sales cycles. Does that quad, is that quad introduced as the account becomes a customer? Or at what point, say you're targeting with one account, do you put the quad in place? And then like, at what when do Yeah, you we're very strategic about our, our account selection. So actually coverage models is very interesting. I'm still getting into this because I've only been with Teradata five months now, but we're very deliberate. We've identified there's about a thousand megadata customers out there around the world. These are big organizations with lots of data, but also the ability and the need to use that data. So not everyone who generates all this data is willing to use it, is capable of using it or similar. But people like banks, large manufacturers, airlines, um, automotive organizations have huge potential because they've got the data, they can see the value. So we've identified that set of customers. We already work with a good number of them already. And so we have a number of targets where we'll put a quad in place or a triad in place to support um, 
prospecting and targeting an entry into that account. But most of our, our customers are long-term customers or medium-term customers we worked with for a while, and we're focused on driving their success, expansion, and we're at the heart of their analytics and answers of what they do for their business. Got it. And what is the size of your operations team that's supporting this? Well, it's, it's interesting. So we talk about, uh, at Teradata, we have go-to-market operations. So if you imagine... Um, in the, the organizational structure, we have our chief revenue officer, we have a consulting organization, and we have the three big regions, EMEA, APAC, Americas. And then we have go-to-market operations on the side. And go-to-market operations is really split into three functions. There's the, the core um, go-to-market operations in corporate in San Diego, which owns the platforms, which owns strategy, large-scale enablement. We have a deal desk and pricing function that um, really enables the governance and structure of complex deals. And then we have revenue operations, which is aligned to the regions and consists of sales operations, um, renewals, proposal management, all of the things you need to do to actually take that global structure and apply it um, locally within a region. So we, um, within EMEA, have five sales operations managers who are aligned to five sales geographies. So they're the business partner from the operations side to everything that the, the VP who runs that geography, for instance, Western Europe, which is France, Italy, Spain, um, has a dedicated sales operations manager who does everything from training and enablement right up to being the operations business partner, the right-hand man along with the um, the head of finance for that geography to really help the, the VP understand their business and run their business. Got it. Um, can we now focus on the tech stack you guys yes. are doing? I know that could be different from a typical interview because of the, the large enterprise accounts you have. Yes. Um, well, the starting point is probably very similar. CRM, <laughs> Salesforce, <laughs> a good number of people are on that. And I've used Salesforce actually since we deployed it at National Instruments um, in 2015 um, and I've got a chance to get into the weeds as well as look at it as a, you know, as a platform and a consumer of it. Um, so we have Salesforce at the core and we built up our Salesforce instance um, about 18 months ago around our business process. So rather than letting Salesforce define how we wanted to work, we really spent a long time working with external expertise, internal expertise to build out what should Salesforce look like to align to our process, complex, large-scale um, account-based selling. And then we've customized Salesforce um, with a series of applications we've built um, around account planning, forecasting, um, that allow us to really get into the details of how do we not just sell an opportunity, but how do we take an account and really penetrate it correctly, um, engage all the different people who, who work with that account, and then how can we understand the, the potential growth and forecasting. So Salesforce itself is the core. We have Eloqua for the marketing team that some of the sales team use for more dedicated campaigns, but we tend to have less of the, the lead flow that you might get in another organization. And it's much more around the, the account planning and the targeted activities that the sales and the wider yeah, account team will be doing at that account um, that's much more interesting. So we have also have a, a custom module around goals, objectives, strategies, and tactics. And pretty much everything our account teams do is aligned to this is what we're trying to do, is the objective that we're going to get, is the series of strategies that will allow us to make that object objective successful, and here's the tactics, the milestones that are going to take place. And it might be 20 different people around the organization who assign those tactics to enable that strategy at an account. All of that lives within Salesforce, which means it's reportable, which means we can link it together and we can build amazing insight. Um, and then on the side, um, we also use Power BI because we've got to be able to show some of that in information combined with other information. So we have corporate dashboards that are developed globally with input from EMEA so that we can really see in the same view as everyone else around the world core sets of, of metrics, KPIs, information, and then we build out local um, reporting and dashboards, um, depending on what we're trying to do directly in Salesforce so we can own it at the EMEA level. And then finally, everything else within the organization actually sits on a Teradata platform. So we eat our own dog food, as it were, and we use our um, analytics and data management capabilities to enable us to look at our install base, our ERP, and everything. So that's available on the side that can flow into other systems like the CRM, like the, uh, the business intelligence platforms. Got it. Now, would you say a couple weeks ago we had 
with the head of customer operations at Trussell, so B to C selling mortgages. Um, would you say that your data quality challenge is simpler than those guys? Because you're on the other. Oh end of the yeah, I wouldn't say simpler um, because we it's both easier for half of it and much more complex for the other half. So we break data quality down into two areas. What we'd call data quality is really about making sure the core systems data about the, the account itself um, and our systems, what's installed and similar, exists and the sales teams can use it. And that's managed, um, it comes from our teledata systems, it comes from our global team, and they're responsible for making sure that's accurate. And when we talk about a customer, say, as Volvo, all the Volvo entities roll up correctly in there. Um, and the marketing teams look at the contacts there. But then we talk about the other set of data, which is what the sales teams and the account teams are putting into Salesforce, and that's really where it gets interesting, because then it's hygiene, because this is information that is input manually. This is information that there's lots of it, because we're talking complex, complex sales interactions, lots of different people engaging, lots of things that traditionally would live in a notebook or in someone's head that we're in getting our teams engaged about putting that directly mm -hmm. into the systems. And there we're trying to build habits so the sales teams understand that they're doing it for themselves. It's their data, it's their accounts, and it's not about putting it in to help sales operations and teledata. They're putting it in so they can make use of it. So we're always thinking about what's in it for me in the eyes of the salesperson and making sure that they understand that they're doing this so that they can drive their business forward. So. That works very well with some of the newer people. Some of the old hands, it takes a little longer. They've got to see the value in it. Mm. Because if you've been working for 20 years with that particular account, you feel that, actually, do I really need to put this into Salesforce? It's in my notebook. Yeah. So on my local PC, I can probably get away with it. So we've got to show value uh, pretty quickly. But once they get used to it, then it's much more about, well, if we can then improve that data quality, you can then take better advantage. We can feed you better content to help you engage around particular initiatives. Got it. Now you're actually moving on to one of the, the future questions, which is about getting buy-in from sales. Yeah. But I want to press on this more. Me as a salesperson, who have been there for 20 years. And one year ago, you're now telling me I need to put all this into Salesforce. Can you give like a specific, like a specific good thing that happens to me as an account manager? for me feeding all of this information in Salesforce. Yeah, so a, a good example, we just ran a big initiative around our competitors and what the scope is, because we're working with big com companies. It's not just competitors, it's partners, it's complementary technologies that are, exist at an account. An account may have hundreds of different technologies, some of which complement us nicely, some of which compete with us um, and are trying to you know, move us out of the account or we're trying to, to move in. And so that information, people immediately think, well, that's just to help um, the company. But by getting that information in, we've started a program where initially it's being done manually by the enablement teams. Whenever we've identified technologies of the account that tie back to an opportunity, we then feed content directly via chatter in Salesforce to the sales team of saying, look, you're talking with this customer about cloud technologies. You've identified this cloud company that does something you know, competitive to us. Here's a set of interesting user stories, technology comparisons. Here's an introduction via chatter to a domain expert who can help you with this. The next step will be automating that so we can actually do that. You know, whenever someone inputs an opportunity in a certain industry around a certain application, it just feeds it in. But initially, by doing it manually, the sales teams can see, right, we've got our competitor tagging down, a, you know, we've, at the moment, the current and next quarter, we're almost at every opportunity has a you know a view of who the competitors and complementary yeah. technologies are. So now we can drive that forward. It's a very good answer to the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, moving on to productivity, uh, and can we focus on the account manager specifically? Yeah. What have you done since joining um, that has increased the productivity of an account manager? Oh, that's a good question. A lot of my focus since I joined has actually been around um, helping our frontline managers um, spend more time and focus with those frontline uh, salespeople. Mm -hmm. Because for, for us, well, I've got three sets of stakeholders in the sales team. I've got my 
account teams, the account managers who are working with the customers. We have the frontline managers who spend a lot of time um, coaching um, and enabling um, the, the customers and the big deals. And then we have our, our second line, the managers who are really the geo VPs and uh, my EVP, who's my main stakeholder, um, who are looking at the business as a whole. Um, and so our focus, um, well, my focus uh, since I've joined has been really around um, enabling visibility and shifting everyone to using Salesforce for our business. So we're no longer working off spreadsheets and notebooks and similar. Everything from quarterly business reviews to ad hoc leadership meetings works out of Salesforce and dashboards. So everything about our business is actually described using the, the systems we're do, doing mm. our business. By enabling the, the, you know, the frontline managers to work like that, they get some really good visibility. And then that enables me to enable my team who are working with the account teams and those frontline managers, spend a lot more time around initiatives that can actually help drive value for them. So it's, it's quite funny. Since I've joined, I've been focused on enabling the, the, the management team while my team can actually spend more time building out initiatives around specific types of technology or driving consumption or driving enablement out to uh, specific teams who can get the most impact. Got it. Now, I know you like sales forecasting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so can we move on to this now? So what is your role in producing, say, the quarterly sales forecast? Oh, yes. This is a really interesting um, topic because that's one of the biggest initiatives. Since I joined, I was thrown in the deep end. Mm -hmm. We made the decision um, for April onwards this year to um, run all of our sales forecasting and our uh, our views as a sales and sales ops led rather than a finance led initiative on a monthly basis. So the first um, the first instance of that was um, around April fifteenth. Um, I joined on April eighth, and we rolled out pretty rapidly, effectively um, a view of what it would take to get that information in. Um, because it existed there, but a lot of it was being extracted by finance, put into a black box, stirred around a bit, mm -hmm. and finance would provide a set of numbers and ask the sales leadership to validate. And that works well for the long-term view of the revenue, the profit and loss, but the sales teams actually have a view of individual opportunities. So we um, remapped the, this mode of just pull everything out of Salesforce and let finance worry about it to a process where on a monthly basis, we make sure by the end of the month that all the sales opportunities are good and the sales teams uh, keep them updated on a, a regular basis, but we run a series of checks and hygiene to make sure that there's no outliers in there. And then our frontline managers sit down with the account teams and our sales ops teams for that um, particular geography and actually run through the deal structures for the next couple of quarters and look at each deal and really uh, place it in a category. Um, like a forecast category, but effectively evolve what the account executives say about the opportunity with additional information. So they effectively put it into a forecast commitment. And then we do the same at the, the next level up at the geography. So I then sit down with my EVP and the, the CFO for EMEA, and we have a view of a roll up of everything that's happening in EMEA over the next um, couple of quarters. But we also have the granularity. We can go and dive in and say, well, actually, this particular deal. We know what's been hedged, where it's going, where the, the, the frontline manager thinks it's going, where the GOVP thinks it's going, and we can make a decision about how that's included in to make our top line number. And it's taken a couple of months to actually drive that through as a, a process that rolls up completely and is feels natural. But now there's no hidden spreadsheets that people are referring to and then in a meeting say, well, my number's going to be this. Everything's in the system, everything is reportable on, everything's mm -hmm. visible. And then that feeds into the dashboard. So our KPIs tie back to our, our forecast. So when we look at things in the forecast, uh, within, within a dashboard, we can um, see the forecast number as well as what the pipeline looks like. Nice. So correct me if I'm wrong here. What you guys are doing now, if you're taking a bottom-up approach to forecasting, yeah. so then you at the top level of EMEA can drill all the way down and then tweak stuff if, if needed to create the forecast. Previously, you were taking data from from sales reps or account managers, they was going into finance and they were doing something that no one knew and then was being out numbers. Yes, exactly. And so now we still have finance working in collaboration with us. So we haven't abstracted finance from this, but we brought them in and sales operations effectively owns that process of getting a, a bookings number yeah. and all that detail. And then finance is a consumer of that bookings number. So our sales leaders are accountable mm -hmm. and they know what they're providing. 
and they're not being asked to sign off on a number, they're actually driving the number. Yeah. And then we can get some really good detail behind the scenes of what does that mean to planning, to revenue, to everything else. So it seems like a much more effective way of forecasting. Yeah, and we've got some plans to evolve it that, uh, that will allow us to, to really get an even better picture. So it's, uh, it's nice because in a complex organisation, when I've worked with more transactional products in the past, you could kind of run rate things out. You could just look at how things, if we just sell a bit more of this or if we increase the win rate. It's not as simple where one deal can actually nudge your number significantly in either direction. You need to have some really good granularity there. Got it. Um, in your almost 14 years of sales management, what has been a metric that you found the most valuable or insightful? Oh, that's... Um, <laughs> There's two. I've, I've one that I've always been a big believer on is time spent with customers. Mm. Not number of meetings, mm. not number of calls or anything like that, but just pure time that you can spend with your customers. Because when you're doing complex sales, whether it's complex of technology or complex um, accounts, it's not how many meetings you do. Because one meeting may take two days, but the output of that meeting, which is like your workshop, could be the foundations for everything that you do moving forward. Where someone who's you know gets in five visits in a day has shaken a few hands, had a few conversations, maybe done a demo, um, and probably is not going to get anywhere. So that's the the first one. That just the time you spend in front of customers um, and engage with customers is a huge measure of success. And do you track that? Do you have a salesperson record the number of hours in each meeting? No, we don't do that because uh, part of the challenge is, is we're trying to give sales value uh, for what they're doing. And because it's complex sales, we're not trying to track activity as much as, say, a transaction organization would. Mm. That's something always front of mind. How do we get people to spend more time? Yeah. And in the coaching programs that are in place with our our sales and our leaders, that's a big part of it, making sure that people spend the right amount of time and planning and engaging with their customers. Yeah. And then the next part of it, we, we follow the Mike Weinberg um, Sales Management Simplified yeah, Approach. Yeah, I literally just finished listening to that book. It is fantastic. <laughs> His new one, Sales Truth, is also oh, really know. good because yeah. it, it teaches some good things about how to deal with purchasing, mm. um, telling them to pound sand and yeah. <laughs> no is a good thing. Um, but... His philosophy, and we've engaged with Teradata with him directly, um, because the fundamentals of sales haven't really changed in 20 years. It's about, can you deliver on your number? Are you getting there? Do you have enough pipeline to get there? And if you don't have enough pipeline to get there, what are you doing to generate the pipeline? And I, I often think about um, a salesperson as a bit like an air traffic controller. They have a number of deals in play, flights in play. Some of them are taking off, they're being found. Some of them are flying, you know, advancing, and some of them are landing. Are you closing? And you need to be able to measure how, um, not just how many are closing, because if they're, they're closing out all of their pipeline and they're not generating, generating anything more, they're going to be in trouble in six months' time. They'll make their number now, and then the next two years may be famine. Likewise, if they're just spending all their time um, generating pipeline but not advancing anything, you have a lot of challenges as well because they may have skills shortages, they may need help be able to close it. Um, it may not be good pipeline, it may be hopes and dreams. So we're looking at ways that we can measure what people are creating and then are they advancing it as well as closing it. So in our dashboards, we look very carefully at effectively what does your pipeline look like for the particular quarter or until the end of the year, what have you committed? So are you going to make your number with your commitments? And then we can measure how far people are getting with their commitments and their success rates. But then we also look at do you have enough pipeline to meet your next 12 uh, months or actually five quarters? Mm -hmm. So do you have enough of a funnel to be able to continue afterwards? And if you don't, what are you creating? What have you created in the last 30 days? Are you that number growing? Do you have 5x the, the, the pipeline needed to hit your quota? Or are you at 2x? But you've gone from 2x to 3x, so you can see you're doing the right thing. And then we look at movement through stages as well. If you imagine you know, our sales process has seven stages um, and you've got 10 opportunities, you've effectively got 70 steps available to you. So over the past month, how many steps have you moved along? If your pipeline's static, you'll have created a load of stuff and just left it there. It won't have moved along. Likewise, once you've closed stuff out, are the other things moving? So effectively, in a couple of tiles in a dashboard, we can understand, well, have you generated enough? If so, then that's a, a good sign. If not, are you generating enough? 
are you advancing it along and then are you able to close it out? Are you committed to closing it out? Yes. So yeah, I'm a bit of a forecast. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then final question is, who has, who would you love to take for lunch in sales ops? Um, so it's actually two. Who, who, who would you love to take for lunch and who's taught you the most? And it could be the same person. Wow, well, yeah, they're, they're, there's, there's a couple of different people, actually. They're probably one of the most important people is a lady called Lorraine Stipek, who is the, the head of operations at National Institute. She was the one that brought me into the, um, the role in 2015 that you really transformed what I was thinking about in terms of my career, what I wanted to spend time on. And she was, a, like me, a, someone who'd been a salesperson, a sales manager, who made the shift into operations. I learned so much in working for her for two years that, yeah, I definitely owe her lunch. Mm -hmm. Um, and part of that, the team that did the transformation project with me as well has been, uh, was critical to my development because that showed me as well is if you're the voice of sales, sales are your stakeholders, but there's also um, business analysts, there's business intelligence, there's IT, there's transformation specialists, process managers who are all part of that picture to make things move along. So I've got a great set of friends from that two-year project yeah. that really have become long-term friends because you know, the friendships for, forged in a <laughs> stress and travel around the world. You 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 know you stay in contact, and you even if you're different companies now, it's a it's an important set of people. And then I think people I don't know, I'd love to take to lunch. Were I had the opportunity a few years ago to be part of a Salesforce briefing center where I visited as a customer to really see how they approach their sales operations. And they have such a complex, changing environment. They were a company focusing on the, the, the SME and the mid-market uh, that you know, five years ago suddenly had this huge shift to enterprise and dramatic growth. I'd love to have lunch with some of the Salesforce uh, operations leadership and see how that's evolved and how do they apply it. Because yeah. I think everyone could learn from that. Good answer. Um, so let me finish with things that I enjoyed from the interview. Um, your approach, and I don't know if I fully understand it because it sounds very complex, but putting as much as you can in Salesforce, I think it's like that to me sounds like best practice because you have all this data here in this one system and you can create really awesome reports. So I thought that was really insightful. Um, the point about, or the example you gave about why a salesperson wants to put this data in Salesforce and that the, the example of how it, actually you're going to add value to my life because I ask this question a lot but I don't often get responses of like tangible responses of how you're going to improve my yes. life as a sales person. We, we made a decision I had a team meeting with my sales ops managers a couple of months ago where we locked ourselves in a room for two days and we talked about challenges and everything and one of the conclusions of that meeting is moving forward we will always ask our corporate team anyone else who wants to make a change what's the value in that What's in it for the salespeople? If we're going to do this effort, what, who wins from doing this? Because if you can't tell us what the value is and who's going to get that value, we're going to say no. And by doing that, we, we've given some really good feedback to others, uh, other groups, our, our global team, and they can build on that because they understand that, well, if there's not value, then we need to understand why are we doing it. So that we've got a commitment. Our team will always ask that now. And Every sales ops team should have that. And then finally, yeah, the, the metric of time spent with customers. We've had time spent selling before, but we haven't had time spent with customers. I don't know if they're the same thing or not, but I think that is, especially with large larger deals, super important for a sales ops team to try and understand because it's going to be hard to sell something to someone if you haven't, especially something complex, if you haven't spent that time face-to-face. -face. Yeah. So that's what I enjoyed. Thank you so much for coming on. That was a masterclass, um, and hopefully we'll have you back again after you've after you spent a few years at Teradata. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. Call me again in a couple of years, and let's see what's happened. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.